Jackson grew up and came of age in an era of chaos. When he was very young, the Revolutionary War broke out. It was bitterly fought in his area on the border between North and South Carolina. <coughs> he lost his mother and his brothers during the Revolutionary War. He never knew his father. It was an extremely brutal time of social dislocation, and this was Andrew Jackson's youth. He had to make his way alone in the world afterwards. He then moved west to Tennessee in the 1780s to start a life for himself. His aspirations were the aspirations of what could be considered the American dream. He rose to become Tennessee's first member of Congress, a Tennessee senator, a judge, a victorious <coughs> general who won one of the most important military victories in the history of the United States, the Battle of New Orleans, and finally president of the United States. No one had ever climbed a ladder like that. It's not clear to me that people even knew such a ladder existed before Andrew Jackson. Jackson was totally contradictory. He could be incredibly sweet and incredibly ferocious. He had a very violent streak, but when that streak was not keyed up, he presented himself as the most mild-mannered, polite gentleman you could imagine. But that friendliness, that generosity, was always governed by Jackson's idea of his interest. If someone stood in the way of his financial interest or his idea of the nation's interest, he would stop at almost nothing to destroy them. The affair between Andrew Jackson and Rachel Donaldson Robards was one totally of passion. Rachel still had a husband living in Kentucky, and not everyone approved of the action that they had taken. Women who were in the Tennessee and Kentucky frontier were expected to be able to be more independent, to have more responsibility, and she took advantage of that, freed herself from a marriage she wasn't happy with. And so there was this great love, there was great utility as well, and ultimately, it had an extraordinary impact on the conduct of his political career. When Andrew Jackson and Rachel Donaldson formed their marriage in their early 20s, they didn't give any thought to how the extra-legal nature of their marriage would play out in Jackson's presidential ambitions. That gave fodder to his political opponents forever, that Mrs. Jackson was a bigamist, that she had been married to two men at the same time. Rachel was dreading moving to Washington City for his inauguration. But his presidency began in tragedy. I try to summon my usual fortitude, but it is in vain. My heart is nearly broke. General, my condolences. Colonel, you knew her well and respected her. I did more than that. I had a sincere regard for her, and now consider her death a calamity. I'm glad you were here. Sir, there's a fight brewing. There's opposition to the appointment of John Eaton to Secretary of War. I must have a man in whom I have complete confidence. We must fight this. This revives me. I was born for a storm. The cop does not suit me. He believed that she had died out of sadness because of the attacks made on her by John Quincy Adams and his political opponents. It set him off on a path to Washington, feeling grief-stricken and furious. Jackson believed that the aristocracy had embedded itself in American government needed to be rooted out. Jackson's hope for the country was that it would be more responsive to the will of the people, that the will of the majority was to prevail. Jackson espoused what he called rotation in office, the idea that office holders, if they stay too long, 
become perhaps inefficient and corrupt. Many of them were let go. Getting it that people outside of a, a small circle had a chance to be part of government operations. Many Americans, including political leaders, before Jackson's time were deeply conflicted on the question of party, on whether party was a good thing or a bad thing. President Jackson came increasingly to believe that party organization was the only way to ensure that the people would remain in power. Jackson was able to transform that Jacksonian personal majority into a bound and disciplined political party because the Democratic Party was not a party, they were the people themselves. It's not our party against their party, it's the people organized against the aristocracy. Jackson felt that the Bank of the United States had too much power. There was a real question whether the bank was there to serve the interests of the government or whether it was there to serve the interests of the stockholders. Jackson saw this as an inexcusable, corrupting force that if public money could be manipulated for private gain, then that way madness led. My object, sir, is to save the country, and it will be lost if we permit the bank to exist. Nicholas Biddle was the president of the Bank of the United States. He was perfectly willing to engineer the panic in order to save the bank. And he said all the banks in the country may break. Everything may break, but the Bank of the United States is not going to break. That's a dangerous man with a dangerous amount of power. The Bank of the United States had a large group of friends they introduced a bill in Congress to extend its charter for another 20 years. Jackson and his cabinet members wrote a veto message that was a smashing appeal toward their folks. The powers conferred upon its agent not only unnecessary but dangerous to government and country. Distinctions in society will always exist under every just government. Equality of talents, of education, or of wealth cannot be produced by human institutions. But every man is equally entitled to protection by the law. To make the rich richer and the potent more powerful, the humble members of society, the farmers, mechanics and laborers have a right to complain of the injustice of their government. There are no necessary evils in government. Its evils only exist in its abuses. If it would confine itself to equal protection and, as heaven does its rains, shower its favors alike on the high and the low, the rich and the poor, it would be an unqualified blessing. Good job. He vetoed the bank. The message struck a chord in the country. Here was a president who was fighting for the common man versus the privileged man. Andrew Jackson embodies the best and the worst of America. There are many important aspects of Andrew Jackson's legacy. Today, we often remember Indian removal and his support for African-American slavery, and those things are true and they must be remembered. Slave ownership was part of the American dream for very many people, and he would have been the perfect exemplar of that. He was able to make himself into a wealthy man, into a prosperous man, a powerful man, through the slave system. It is said that he treated his slaves kindly, but not so kindly as to free them. There were people, even in Jackson's day, who were denouncing slavery as immoral, but he never thought anything about slavery as a fundamental moral question. As a military leader, 
Andrew Jackson waged extraordinary numbers of campaigns against Native Americans. The southeastern part of the United States, Georgia, southern Tennessee, North Carolina, it's, it's a beautiful country, and especially once gold was discovered, the United States government wanted the Cherokees out, they wanted the land. Indian removal not only was the policy of the nation, but had been the policy of the nation for some time before that. What was different about Jackson was that Jackson brought an urgency to the issue. The Indian Removal Act was Jackson's first big legislative priority. It wasn't just one round of the Cherokees and one removal west. These are decades long removals that are occurring of our native people from the southeast. Andrew Jackson is known as Jack the Devil by the Cherokee people. To try to dismiss Jackson and remove him somehow from the American conversation because of his stance on slavery, because of his stance on Native Americans, is really to foreclose the possibility of learning from history. History is messy, and we don't turn our eyes away just because they do things that we don't like to do. It's all a part of it. It's the bitter with the sweet, the good with the bad. And there's certainly those measures in him. The crisis of Jackson's presidency, you might say, came in 1832-1833, when he faced the nullification crisis in South Carolina. South Carolina said, we are going to use the force of the state to prevent the federal government from enforcing its own laws. And if the federal government tries to enforce them, we will secede. Jackson believed deeply and indubitably in the power of union. If the Union had fallen apart, that would have been dishonoring his own blood family's sacrifices. <clears throat> John C. Calhoun was, at best, a second-rate governmental theorist who created the, the blueprint for secession. South Carolina joined the Union with the understanding that the state has a right of resistance to oppression or secession from the Union. If I can judge from the signs of the times, nullification and secession, or in the language of truth, disunion is gaining strength. The clash of wills between Andrew Jackson and John C. Calhoun, and Jackson's clear willingness to resort to force in the last resort, reassured people that the government was not going to fall apart, the country was not going to fall, fall apart. The union must be preserved. Disunion by armed force is treason. For Jackson, this challenge cut to the core of the question of whether the United States was going to be a nation or not. Without union, our independence and liberty would never have been achieved. Without union, they can never be maintained. Divide into 24 smaller number of separate communities, and then we shall see our sons made soldiers to deluge with blood the fields they now till in peace. The time at which I stand before you is full of interest. The eyes of all nations are fixed on our republic. The event of the existing crisis will be decisive in the opinion of mankind of the practicability of our federal system of government. Great is the state placed in our hands. Great is the responsibility which must rest upon the people of the United States. Jackson actually adopted a series of very carefully calibrated, very carefully controlled measures to meet nullification <coughs> without violence. The crisis was settled by a compromise in Congress. He beat back the nullifiers. He gave us an extra 30 years to form bonds that would be tested so deeply and so tragically in the Civil War. Jackson set a precedent for Lincoln and his contemporaries to insist on the preservation of the Union in 1860-61. My public life has been a long one, and I cannot hope that it has at all times been free from errors. Anyone who believes in democracy, anyone who believes in its future, has to grapple with Jackson. 
We have now lived almost 50 years under the Constitution, framed by the sages and patriots of the Revolution. Jackson was in the right place at the right time for the development of the American democracy. He was there at a moment that was very, very difficult. We have had our seasons of peace and of war with all the evils which proceed or follow a state of hostility with powerful nations. By the end of his term, Jackson had an economic philosophy, a social philosophy, a political program, which was coherent, enduring, and which no one would have predicted in 1828. I leave this great people prosperous and happy in the full enjoyment of liberty and peace and honored and respected by every nation of the world. He brought more people into the political process than had been at any point in America's past. And so if you want to find the beginnings of a democratic culture, you have to start with Jackson. I thank God that my life has been spent in the land of liberty and that he has given me a heart to love my country. <clears throat>